Amen. I want to talk to you about never losing your reverence. Never lose your reverence. And so we're going to go there. I don't know if you all saw. Did you see anybody? I don't know if you're familiar with a guy by the name of Bishop Marmari Emmanuel. Anybody? He always holds a cross in his hand. And he looks like, uh, uh, he looks like a Roman Catholic priest kind of, sort of, but... But he, in Australia, he got stabbed. A 16-year-old boy walked down while he's preaching the gospel. I watched it and came up and stabbed him in the head. Uh, from my understanding, he stabbed him three times. He's going to be okay. Uh, but the whole church went at it, and then the neighborhood found out about it. They gathered. Now, these neighborhood are a rough bunch. They're not believers, but they love this man, I guess. And they literally were stomping on cop cars and causing a major problem because they wanted, they, they had the 16-year-old kid in custody in the church, and they wanted them to release him to them. <laughs> so, so I was like, I guess it's a good thing, but a bad thing, amen, because we don't do that. But anyways, I thought it was kind of wild. But I, keep your... Keep him listed in your prayers. I, I love everything he preaches. Uh, I think the guy's spot on in regards to a lot of things, and, and just pray the very best for his recovery and that God would just bless him. Amen? Amen. Deuteronomy 28, we're going to start there in verse 58. Reverence, never lose your reverence. Reverence means this, a feeling of profound awe and respect. If you want a relationship with God, you can never lose your reverence. And we're going to find out people in the Bible that actually lost their reverence, and it cost them dearly. I believe the body of Christ at large has lost their reverence. I'm going to say that again. I believe the body of Christ at large has lost their reverence. Many are sitting home rather than be watching, you know, Blue Bloods and, and SWAT and all these other programs rather than being in the house of God on a Wednesday night. I'm just saying. And what is it? That's a loss of reverence. They, listen to me. They have forgotten where they have come from. Now, we're going to look at this, okay? If you do not carefully observe, uh, verse 58, if you do not carefully observe all the words of this law that are written in this book, that you may fear this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God, then the Lord will bring upon you and your descendants extraordinary plagues, great and prolonged plagues, and serious and prolonged sicknesses. Look at Psalm 2, verse 11. It says this, Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Psalm 119, verse 120. My flesh trembles for fear of you and I am afraid of your judgments. I don't know. We just don't hear that much. I think we forget that Jesus isn't walking around in a flowing robe in glory and everything's just... Are you, are you, do you understand that the Bible says when he was here, there were times that the disciples refused to ask him any questions because they were afraid to say anything. You ever get, about somebody, get around somebody and you're like, I don't want to say nothing. I don't want to look stupid. I can imagine the disciples say, he's going to rebuke me again if I say something. Like, oh, you have little faith or something like that. You know, and the Lord would never belittle you, but boy, he would let you know if you had big faith or little faith. And so we see here, uh, the, the word of the Lord is teaching you and I that we're to tremble when you're in the atmosphere of God. You really have this deep intimacy with the Lord. There's a reverence that comes with that. It's, I don't understand, you know, people coming to an altar wanting to get right with God. And you can tell the reverence people have and they, they, because they'll come up and they're chomping on their gum. I want to get right with God. You don't want to get right with God. Go sit down. I, I wonder if the Lord will allow me to do that sometime. You know, when you see somebody, they're not, they're not in posture. You know, I'm not saying that it's the outer part of the person, but sometimes you can tell individuals that really have no respect for the things of God. Kind of like when the pastor gives the altar call and people go up to get up to go to the bathroom. I want to take a, one of those things, what do they call those things that you throw in? A boomerang. Amen. I love that. I really would. I think it'd be the best thing in the world. Just to hit them upside the head. They don't know who did it. And we'll just blame the Lord for it. When God brought the children of Israel out of bondage, he had to teach the people the ways of God. How to enter his presence. I want you to know today, God is not a pushover. 
God is not a pushover. There's etiquette in the kingdom. Everybody say etiquette. When you come to the master, there's ways of doing things. And the Lord, the more, closer you get to God, the more is required. Even the word of the Lord says, don't let many of you, I believe it's James, the third chapter. Don't let many of you desire to be teachers. Because the, it, your judgment is stricter. God holds you to a higher, just like you would a two-year-old child or your 15-year-old or a 30-year-old. There's different standards that you expect out of your children. Amen? And so the Lord has the same. And so there's a reverence in regards to the things of God. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 12. It says this, And now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. And so we see here there's etiquette, reverent fear of the Lord. Now we read of a situation, and it really stunned me. I was reading it today, and the Lord brought a lot of things into remembrance uh, of, of, uh, to me and really spoke to me about making sure that you, we call it unction. What that means, unction means, is that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. I don't trust when I'm out on this platform. I don't trust that I'm coming out with education to share with you. I don't stand before you to share education. Uh, if I just share education without revelation, or you can even glorify in revelation, it has to have unction on it. In other, in other words, it's got to have God on it. So whatever you do, it's got to have God on it. If God, you, you say, well, I love the Lord. That's wonderful, but it's got to have God on it. I could, I, you, listen, I've got a relationship with the Lord, a personal relationship with the Lord, but when I come and stand in the place where I'm ministering to people, i got to have God on it. And it's not just me. It's when you're in the nursery, you got to have, there are people that are doing it because they have to, and there's people that are called to it. Are you hearing me? you got to have God on it. And then when you're called to it, for instance, these instrumentalists, my prayer is they're not just honoring God with a gift because I could get up here and talk. You can have the gift of gab. You can have the gift and anointing to play, or you can be anointed by the Spirit of God. And you got to have that unction. you got to have the fire of God on you. If you don't have the reverence of the presence of God, and you don't pay the necessary price that's necessary, then you're operating out of gift rather than the anointing. So in other words, go, that goes with your job. That goes with everything aspect in life. In your marriage, that goes in regards to uh, your gifting, working camera. Whatever you do, it's I'm doing it as unto the Lord. I need God's ability on my inability. I need God's... And then whatever you do, you're going to do it for the glory of the Lord. We were talking with Angela and Rudy before the service because I've asked them, and we've, they, they kind of brought something up to me, and I asked them to, to go ahead and head up our prayer meeting before the services. And so you're going to notice Miss Angela is going to be directing how those prayer services are to go when we have uh, prior to services. And I want them to um, oversee that. And I told her in there, I said, now, before you, you know, accept, I know this is something in your spirit, but before you accept, just know that you get the attention of devils. And, and now, now here's the thing. The Lord said this, my yoke is easy. Well, it's easy when you realize you got to have an unction on you when you step in. So you can't treat it lightly. You can't be doing your own thing all day long, expect just to show up here and then just jump right into a gift. My friend, that is not right. And we're going to talk about that today. Musicians, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to everyone. Where's my musicians at? They better be in here. All right. Is Brandon in here? Where's Brandon? There he is. Okay. I looked over here. Brandon's over there. All right. You can't just say, come in here and say, oh, I'm going to, here it goes. I'm going to do my own thing. And then I'm just going to get up there and do my gift. My friend, that's very dangerous because it has no reverence attached to it. Because we're going into the presence of a holy God. That's why I commissioned the people a while back, and I need to stay on it, is before you even get here on Sunday morning, to have your prayer time already before you come in, so that we don't have to plow so hard to get people in the atmosphere of the Lord. 
that you've already got your time in prayer already done before you walked in. And so there we go. So when you're in a musician you, or, or a singer, you've already had time with God. You've called on the blood of Jesus to cleanse you. You're going into the atmosphere of God knowing that imperfect humanity is about ready to go behind the veil and lift up the name of the Lord. Now the Bible says there were two individuals that, had, that, that, that were uh, irreverent to the things of God and God killed them. Their names are... Uh, uh, Nadab and Abihu, and you can find it in Leviticus, the 10th chapter. In verse 1, it says this. Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire, or another translation would say strange fire, before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke, saying, by those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. So Aaron held his peace. Now the sin was, and many scholars depict what the, what the actual sin was, because it doesn't exactly tell you exactly what their sin was, but you can read in between the lines. Number one, their sin was an irreverent act to the living God. Some had have suggested that one of their sins was taking on an office that was not prescribed to them, but the high priest. So they were, they, that office was not theirs. That's when you get into problems where you got individuals. We've got a big problem with this today in the body of Christ. Everybody and their mothers on, on YouTube and their prophet so-and-so. And I want to say, what do you profit of? And you'll find out they don't even have, they don't have a church. They don't go, but they're a prophet. And then because they have charisma, they get a handful of followers. And then everybody starts taking what they're saying to the bank. I got a real problem. Like, like you'll, you'll see this big time. Listen, I got no problem with street preachers, but ask them, where's their local church? Mo I'm going to say this. You ready? Most street pre preachers do not submit to a local church. Most of them have problems with local, here's why. Many of them are rogue. Many of them are doing their own thing. They do not know how to submit to authority. Now God will use them. We find that out in the word of the Lord. The Bible teaches that Jesus said, leave them alone. At least they're, they're on our side. If they're not speaking against us, they're speaking for us. But they have no, they, they, they can't graft. They try to get people in to their following. We've had individuals, I think uh, Caleb brought a handful of them in to the house. And these guys did nothing but bad mouth the church while they were here. Well, that's wrong. You don't, I, don't, I don't go up and bad mouth. You see what I'm saying? It's rogue. So what is that? Well, well there's no authority. There's an irreverence to the anointing of the Spirit of the Lord. What other sin could they do? They were prescribing themselves to be something when they were nothing. That's why individuals that say, well, I want to be a preacher. Okay, are you called? I, I like what my pastor says. He says this. He says, if you can do anything else, do it. If there's anything else you can do, do it. Because people have no clue. Now, is it torment for me? Absolutely not. I wouldn't do anything different. But I'm called, number one, and I'm anointed to do it. If you're not anointed, you attract demonic power that you will not be able to uphold. I've had individuals come into my office wanting to shepherd churches. I told them I didn't think it was, they weren't ready. They weren't prepared. They did it anyways. And I can't go into how bad it got for them. But people, I'm talking really, really bad. Their life is torn apart. Their children's life destroyed. Why? They weren't anointed. But see, they wanted to be numero uno, which they thought was numero uno. Listen, the Bible said the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Any great among you needs to serve. Just because I'm behind this pulpit does not mean anything. It simply means God gave me a mouthpiece. That's it. Amen? All right. Nadab and Abihu, what else? They also took not the fire from the burnt offering, but their own. It was strange. And so they took the fire that was not from the consistent burning altar. They took their own. Now that's very dangerous because that's, watch this, that would be like, I'm going to get up and minister on the platform. I don't need God. I was busy today to do it. And here's what we're saying. We never say it out loud, but I was, got busy today, this and that. I'm just going to go. And, and, and you're, you're trusting in your gift. And guess what? Your gift will move. 
God will move people. But if you don't know how to get in, you're, you're offering without realizing it, strange fire. It's, it's, it, you're offering your gift. Even seemingly people will get touched from your gift, just like Elvis could sing and girls would pass out. But what are you emulating? What, there's no, there's no, the anointing is what breaks the yoke, not your gift. So you can have a gift to play keys and you just get up here to wing it or you get up to play bass and you say, well, I can wing it because I have a gift. That's all wonderful. But people, I'm telling you, you're going to stand before the king of glory for offering strange fire because you didn't get the anointing, the anointing, the unction on you. You got to have God's unction. You, you might even think it came out the same. Well, it's not. See, I can talk to you. It seemingly is coming out the same education of what I've learned through the scriptures. But then the anointing is what shoots it out. So you might hear something. You're hearing something completely different. You're hearing something way different. And that's the anointing. The anointing is able to take the word that I speak. You ask three different people what I sp spoke, and many of them will tell you something possibly a little bit or completely different of what they received. That's the spirit. That's the anointing. That's the anointing. And we need that unction. We need, but that only comes through reverence to the presence of God. It's respect for the anointing. It's respect for the presence it's honoring God's sanctuary. It's honoring God's house. That's why I'm big on talking about tithes and offerings because the word tells us that as we do those things, we're honoring the Lord. It's honoring. That's why the word said that Cain was refused by God because he didn't honor God with his offering. When we don't do this, so we're saying things, but then we're not doing them, and therefore that's not honoring the Lord. And it's doing the same thing Nadab and Abihu did. They, had, they were irreverent to the things of the, uh, things of the Lord. Um, they offered it together. So both of these, Nadab and Abihu, offered it together when prescribed. It was supposed to be a single priest, possibly desiring the results of a prescribed chapter. Pri prior to that, th they saw the fire uh, uh, Aaron uh, and Moses, the Bible said fire came out, consumed the sacrifice. All the people fell down and said they were worshiping God. Can you imagine such a sight? So what happened was most likely they saw this and they want, we want to see this. So they went in and said, we want this glory. And the Bible says God won't share his glory with any. And they, and they went in and used their office and they got, got strange fire and they brought it and they tried to call, do the same thing when only the priest was supposed to do it. And one priest, not both. And we see a major situation happen where God says, no, this is an irreverent act. And God had, listen, you, you say, well, it's overkill. But you got to understand, even with the church sometimes, when people get involved in sin, sometimes we got one person, sometimes depending on the sin, if two people are involved sexually, usually one person has to leave. Well, that's not fair. No, it is for you. You shouldn't have, you shouldn't have done that. And so for the sake of one, and then you got you to pass, uh, you got to make a righteous judgment. And the, and the right thing on both sides would be, whatever God says, I'm going to do it. Ra instead of somebody getting mad and upset, well, it just goes to show there was irreverence there. You see what I'm saying? And so we got to be careful. Open our mouth up. Speak. Listen, you want to curse your kids? Talk about the ministry. Talk about the preacher at the dinner table. You curse your children. When you run your mouth against your pastor, that, man, that's like that, that's just like 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 spitting in your own eye. Just it's not good. And 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 the effects usually are irrevocable. You 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 just can't say I didn't mean that. That that that's going to go with those kids on, and that's on you. You got to stand before God for that. Um, it's possible that they were also intoxicated. We see it in the next. Uh, following verses where the Lord begins to put stipulations on Moses and Aaron about making sure the priests don't drink wine or intoxicating drink. And the reason for that was, and most likely in my opinion, is these men were very loose around the presence of God. Now remember, these guys were with the Lord when he displayed his glory to 70. He showed himself. He displayed his glory to over 70 elders of God. They were so accustomed to being around the anointing they got too comfortable and they began to be, get irreverent. And that happens through pride.
They got an elevated position. Pride stepped in, and therefore God comes in and, and has to take care of it. And a lot of people, we say, a lot of people uh, now would say they don't have that issue. Um, that God doesn't kill people today, but, but maybe not, but they're spiritually dead. They're, they are spiritually dead. They are so ice cold to the voice of the Spirit and uh, very, very dangerous ground. Strange fire is the irreverent act. Uh, this irreverent act is what all of the acts that I just mentioned culminated into. So when we take up strange fire, um, it, all these specific acts can manifest in a person's life. Strange fire was offered, and God's presence was so offended that he killed them. Fire was to come from the altar and nowhere else. The fire will not come through education. We just mentioned that. Fire will come only through someone surrendered to and with deep reverence for the anointing of God to do what God has prescribed. And so you say, well, I'm, I'm anointed. Uh, if you're anointed to do camera, then you, you're, you're, you, you can't be anointed to do camera if you show up late. Sit down. People that can't be on time will never be used by God. You're supposed to greet and you're supposed to, I don't know what the thing is. 15, is it 15, 30 minutes early? 15, what is it? I'm getting everybody selling something different. What is it? 45 minutes. And, and on, on Wednesday, it's different. It's usually 30 because a lot of people are just getting off. And then if you can't, the way to deal with that is to make a phone call, to text message. And that's if you can't. What, what, anything less than that is irreverent. You are not whole, you, you just, well, you know, I was a little late and had some come up and, you know, the dog peed on my shoe and, you know, and everything, else, you know, and we get all these excuses, but God knows. Well, I got in traffic. Well, why didn't you, you knew traffic was going to be there. Why didn't you leave early? You, you see, see, it, you, you wouldn't treat your, many people would not treat their employer the way that they treat God. And, it, and we get the mentality, well, I'm a volunteer. They should be so overwhelmingly blessed by my presence. And the reality is, is we're, we're serving God. When you, I mean, I'm serving the Lord. And here's the thing, I'm serving God. And at your work, well, I'm always late at work too. Well, that's dishonoring God too because as a believer, you should be emulating excellence in everything you do. Well, I got to work on that one. Well, working on, well, you've been working on it for 50 years. Repent means change. So we, we're talking about reverence, reverencing God. Reverencing the Lord is being on time. Reverencing God is emulating character. Reverencing God is watching your mouth. Reverencing God is living a holy lifestyle. Reverencing God is, is spending time in his word. Why? We just read about fear in the Lord. The reverent fear of of God. I, I, I get in God's word and sometimes I'm sitting there, when God begins to reveal himself, there should be an utter reverence or, or a fear of the Lord that you don't want to say anything wrong. You don't want to, when I come up here, I feel more of the reverence or the fear of the Lord really than anything because you don't want to, and there's times where the presence gets so, so powerful, you don't want to mess it up and you can mess it up. You let the wrong person have the microphone, the presence leaves. Pastor Chuck, I got a word from the Lord. No, you don't sit down. Be quiet. <laughs> Pastor, no, I got a word. No, you don't. Be quiet. Well, I do, and you didn't let me have them. You don't know nothing. See, see, see. Where did you, how many hours did you spend before service to hear the voice of God? You see what I'm saying? You all don't pay me to sit on my butt or play golf three days a week. You pay me to you you pay me to get into the atmosphere of the Lord, so that when we're on this platform, we can govern govern the atmosphere, it, and it has to be governed. You, you say, well, no, God just, no, God just doesn't govern it. God, puts, God, just, God just didn't call Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abu. He called who? Moses. And then people say, well, this end move of God won't be through any man. It's just going to be through. It's not going to be through the whole body. It'll be through significant men or women that God orchestrates, and then it'll flow. It's not, it's not just going to happen, and, and it's just everybody. Everybody's leading it. No, that doesn't work that way. No, I, no not one place in the Bible does that happen. Not one place. Even in the book of Acts, there was, there was governing authorities, and the word of the Lord spoke about 
what? The fivefold ministry office gift. You got the apostle, which is the little one, little finger. Then you got the pointy finger, which is the prophet. The longest finger, which re reaches into the farthest depths of the, the planet, is the evangelist. The ring finger, or the ring finger, is the pastor, and the little finger is the teacher. And the, and the apostle operates in all of them. And so that's, and God said he gave that to the church for the edification of the body. And so we see that God has orchestration. You can, an army just doesn't move without leadership. And so that's where God, God's going to, when God begins to pour out his spirit, he, you're going to see God, special moves of the spirit, the hand of God on special organizations or ministries. And God's got a leader of that specific ministry that's moving in power, and God, and God will bless it. Some will be ministering to hundreds of thousands, some to tens of thousands, and et cetera. All right, David was too familiar with God's presence. Uh, we read it in 2 Samuel, the sixth chapter, verse 2. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal, Judah, to bring up the ark of God, whose name is called by the name, the Lord of hosts, who dwells between the cherubim. So they set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ohio, the sons of Abinadab, drove the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab. Now they had been with the, the two sons, Uzzah and Ohio. They were around the ark for a little bit of time. They got familiar with the ark because it was allowed to be around their presence. Now they're out there, they're blowing trumpets. David wants to bring the ark. Now the ark represents the presence of God. And they're coming, they're coming, the presence of God. And David's rejoicing because he's bringing the ark, which represents the presence, back into Jerusalem. And the Bible said the ark stumbled. And, and when it, the, the oxen stumbled, and the cart, the cart with the ark of the covenant on it moved around, and the Bible tells us that Uzzah reached out his hand and God struck him for his irreverent act. Is God not able to control, to, to protect himself? Of course he is. And the ark represented the presence of God and no man was to touch it. So what happened? Well, it was technically all on David. David should have looked more into it and should have realized you don't put the ark on a new cart just like the, 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 the Philistines did. The ark is to be carried on the shoulders of men and the Leviticus priest. And what that represents, there's a lot of representation in the body, is the ark is represented. You carry the ark of the, of the covenant or the presence of God through prayer. You want the presence of God on your life, it comes through prayer. It doesn't come any other way. There's no new way of doing it. It comes through prayer. And that's, what, and the pray, uh, that's why even the ministry, we have watchmen on the wall um, coming up this week. Is that right? Uh, and Miss Nettie handles that. And then, uh, and we have our, uh, we've been in a seven-year prayer revival on Thursday nights. Everything established in prayer. You've, anything we do in this ministry has got your personal walk with God. If there's no prayer life, there's no presence. There's no ark. He got too familiar. David got familiar. So David starts looking into it, and we find out what happens. 2 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 12 now it was told King David, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with gladness. And so it was when those bearing the ark, so now they're not, it's on, not on a cart anymore. They're holding the cart on the shoulders of the priests. And when they had gone six paces, that he sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep. And then David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a lit, he's very thankful nobody died. No one was dead. And so David begins to rejoice before the Lord. Now the ark of the Lord was, came into the city of David, and Michal, Saul's daughter, who David, David's wife, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. And we know the story about that. But here's the thing. There was an irreverence, and when David got it right, things began to flow. You got to look into your life. If things are falling apart, there's a lot of things dying, then there's something not right. There's something not right with the ark. Everywhere the ark went, it blessed the house. Obed-Edom, when the ark was placed in his home, the whole house was blessed. David found out about it. He said, I got to get the ark into Jerusalem. I've got to get the ark out of there. But there's a prescribed manner for the blessing of the Lord. And reverence can never, uh, you, you can never get accustomed. And, and it's so sad because the, the, the longer you're around the ark, the more susceptible people are to taking advantage of the presence of God. Well, praise God, we're used to that all the time. People always get in touch by the Lord, and then it doesn't move you anymore. And that should concern you. 
because you should be getting into the presence of God at home. You know, sometimes, I'm going to tell you right now, a lot of people, they'll come here the right away, and, and they say, well, I haven't been touched in a while. Okay, are you getting touched at home? Because if you're not, God's, God brings you here to teach you one thing, and that is the how get in the presence of God for yourself and learn how to dig a hole for yourself and get into that river. Because this house is to sustain, it's to encourage and strengthen, it's for united believers to come together to worship. And then when you grow and mature and learn how to dig that well, then you are being a blessing to this house, finding people within this house that have yet to learn how to dig their own well, and you're helping them dig their, their well. But when you start getting a critical spirit, then you're in danger. You start getting critical about, oh, the music's too loud, or, you know, the pastor don't preach anointed like he used to, or whatever. And God will dry it up. I'm anointed because I'm sharing the word of the Lord, and it might not, it might not be anointed to everybody, but that's all based. Somebody is going, That'll be the, that was the best message I've ever heard. And somebody else would be like, man, I was dead as a doornail. What, what's the difference? Well, that's why Jesus would say, he who has ears to hear what? Let him hear. And so it's based on where you're at with God. It doesn't, and sometimes it doesn't mean you're not, a, you're not spiritual. It just means God wants you. You heard a word. You heard, like, just word. Now go home, saturate it, get it. Get it dropped down into your spirit. What are, you, are, you, are you hungry for that? Well, I'm losing my hunger. Man, you could, if you're hungry for God, you hear John 3, 16, you're, you have tears streaming down your face. You hear something, you hear that so much, but when you're hungry for God, you can say something just so little as John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and tears will begin to stream down your face as you're in tune with the spirit of God. Amen? Never lose sight of your own imperfections and need for saving and continued saving. So you, the, the key to staying reverent in your walk with God is to never lose sight of your own imperfections. When you get critical and judgmental of other people and pointy finger, of, you, you just got the gift of, you know, people say, I have the gift of discernment, and they're bu busy discerning everybody else's issue. Well, that's not the gift of discernment. That's called a critical spirit. That's the accuser of the brethren. And so when you get like that, it, you know, you can read people and you, everything's negative and this and that. Then, then, then you've entered into losing sight and then you're entering into an irreverence. Uh, clothed in humility will keep a person from irreverent acts in his presence. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 3 says this. Do not be in a hurry to leave the presence of the king. Let me see what this says. Do not be hasty to go from his presence. Do not be hasty to go from his presence. Just a little nugget right there that I have found to be so true in fellowshiping with the Spirit for the last 36 years. Don't be in a hurry to leave his presence. When you go before God, it's, it's irreverent to say, okay, I got five minutes. Well, that's all I got. No, it's all you got because you didn't give him your best. Go to bed earlier, get up earlier, and have your time with God. Say, I want, I, because otherwise, anything short of that is an irreverent act. And how can, now, when you're a baby, you know, and you're growing, God's so patient with us. He's saying, you, right now, he's going, are you learning anything? So I didn't have time. You had time. Amen? That's good preaching. I already mentioned chewing gum. That's so irreverent. Here we're worshiping God, and you got and people come up to me, and they want they want to chew gum, and I want to pray for them. They want the Holy Ghost. Are you kidding me? You got to choke on your gum. Unholy life, and then come okay. Uh, pride, religious pride, very dangerous. People, what happens is they get so puffed up in themselves or in their gift that they then start. Um, they don't even realize what they're, they're on the side of the adversary. And they don't realize the devil's using them to tear things down rather than build things up. And it's called religious pride. Very careful. James chapter 4 verse 10 says this, Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. And Psalm 5 uh, verse 7, come on up band. Chapter 5 verse 7, But as for me, I will come into your house in the multitude of your mercy in fear of you, I will worship towards your holy temple. 
I will worship towards your holy temple. So we go back. I will what? Come into your house in the multitude of your mercy and fear of you. So there's got to be a reverent aspect of God, a reverent fear of the Lord. When, when a person is having trouble with sin, you're, you've entered into forgetting what you've fallen from. So weaknesses that, that hit our life and say, and we all go through spurts, and you got to understand, what, well, what is that? Why am, I, why am I entering in? Why is it so easy to fall into this sin? Well, because it's a lack of fear of the Lord. When we don't fear God, we sin easier. When we don't fear the Lord, when you're blowing your top easy, that's, you've lost fear of the Lord. And we all can fall into that, but it's the truth. If you fear God, you wouldn't be calling people idiots, stupid. My God, come on, somebody. Somebody cuts you off. Amen. Because, I mean, so... We, we, we gotta, we, what do we got to do to get there? Well, we get there by spending time with the Lord, asking for forgiveness and mercy. When you ask God, when you fail miserably, or you don't fail miserably, you just fail, going before the Lord and asking the Lord to forgive you is an act of humility. You're acknowledging your failures, which are necessary for reverence. The fact that you're acknowledging your failure, that's why it's so crucial for husbands and wives to make up speedily to make up speedily. And the reason for that is, is because it's an act of humility. It's an act of humility because otherwise the enemy, that's why the Bible says, be careful that you do that because the, otherwise you give Satan uh, a foot, a stronghold. Satan's, this isn't a game. And so we got to really be careful watching over our reverence for the Lord. The, and, and, you know, reading the old covenant is, is, is necessary. God is the, same, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Just because we have the Old Testament doesn't mean God's not. He is still the same way he was back then. We're under a different dispensation where the judgment of God is deflected or the wrath of God is deflected off of his people. But the Bible tells us that Jesus, the Lamb, is coming back, King of kings, Lord of lords, and he's going to come back and destroy his adversaries with his tongue. The Bible says the blood at the war of Armageddon will be so thin, it'll be up to the bridles. I mean, he is going to slaughter flesh, people slaughter them. Zechariah chapter 14 says that, that he's going to come back and, and, and their, 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 their skin will literally fall off their body while their bones are still erect. That is like a, his tongue is like a nuclear bomb. <laughs> he's going to slaughter kings. He had Samuel, Agag, because Saul didn't ha um, destroy him. Samuel, Samuel, the prophet. Now, I just want you to see this. Here's the prophet. Okay, so we'll just say Pastor Chuck. And I told, I, I, not to put, I said, Adley, take care of it. He didn't take care of it. I come up, and I come up with my Benny Hinn suit on, you know. And I take out a hatchet, and here's the adversary, and I hack him in pieces. Aren't you glad we live in the new covenant? We would be using boomerangs. I'd be using hatchets. What about the, the, the prophets of old? You see the prophets of old, you see... You see, Ezra, the Bible found out when these people were marrying heathen women and heathen men and having kids with these heathens rather than God, the Bible said he pulled out their hair, their hair, other head, and he pulled out his beard. People would say, this guy's done lost his mind. But that's called righteous indignation. We see today we go, oh yeah, I sinned. I, I committed sin. Oopsie doozy. No fear. We just think that, oh, God, will, he'll forgive us. But we don't understand. When we're like that and we treat God like that, it, if we don't get it right and we don't repent of that irreverent act towards sin, usually, well, all the time, within five years, you, you won't even be around. Some of you are already starting to scatter. Everything is a test. How many times? You all have heard me say this. Look to your left and right. In five years, person, there's somebody you ain't going to see here no more. I don't know what Bible we're reading. If you can't serve, that's why I like saying, I went to Pastor Parson at Valor Bible College, and I looked at all of them, and I said to them, I said, I said uh, which by the way, Bri Briage, where's Briage at? She, she leave for a minute. She, she's in the Bible college. She just uh, joined the Bible college at Valor, and our cohort. Amen. And Briaja, or Bri uh, Brianna just signed up. Raise your hand. Brianna just signed up. She's getting her, um, her, her degree in um, 
biblical counseling. She's getting her bachelor's. She just signed up for Valor. Isn't that awesome? Amen. But I was at, the, at Pastor's Bible College, and I looked at all these kids, and I was like, listen, anybody can serve God when you're in Bible college. Anybody can serve God. I said, Bible college and prison are the same. Everybody in prison can serve Jesus. But it's when you get out, and you got nobody at your left, nobody at your right. You had to, something happened, you had to move. You don't have an on fire anymore. You don't have a church that's Holy Ghost outpouring. What are you going to do? I, I know what I'd do. If I, went, if I wasn't preaching and, I was, and God called me to some other place and they, they, it was in Podunk Q and they had the first church of Frigid Air, I could tell you where I'd be on Sunday morning. I'd wear a jacket and I'd go into the first church of Frigid Air because that's the only place there was to go. Because the Bible says to gather together, the assembling of yourself, don't forget, forsake the assembling of yourself together. Yourself is, whether they're Baptist, Methodist, do it the way you like or not, it's the church. And you gather. And you encourage. If you're not there, well, I didn't get nothing out of it. Isn't that, give me, give me, my name is Jimmy. Everything's about what I can get out of church. What about what you can give? What about you can give a smile, you can give a hug somebody, you can pray intercession, you can pray for that pastor that's got to deal with those people every single time and be discouraged that that church hasn't seen one single convert in three years? That's the reverent fear of the Lord. And, and, and we really got to get back to that and maintain that, that reverence for God. That'll keep you living right. That'll keep you praying. When you do stuff wrong, it'll get on you. When you read how God used to, I mean, there's things that I read in the Lord and that I'm just going, Oh my gosh, narrow is the way that leads to life and few there be that find it. Woo! You say this, you say that. You say thou shalt not murder, but I say to you, whoever says you fool is in danger of, of the hellfire. Uh-oh. What does that mean? I don't know exactly, but fear hits my heart. It straightens me out. Oh God, forgive me for that time I yelled at that person that cut me off. I said, idiot, I'm sorry. You feel that rage come up on the inside of you? That's not God. You live with that, you don't go to heaven. I don't know what, I don't know what Bible we're reading. It's got to be laid in an altar in reverent fear. Every day, I don't live like this. I don't live like, oh God, watch, if you, if I'm, if I'm going to mess up and you're going to hit me over the head. No, but I have this amazing reverence and thanksgiving for the grace of God that saved a sinner like me. I, I'm so thankful. I can't tell you. We should be saying thank you a thousand times a day. Thank you so much for this mercy you gave me. You see, when you're like that, there's no way I'm planning to go out clubbing Friday. There's no way. Well, I'm going to go clubbing Friday. There's no way you're doing that. Why? i got to be with Jesus. Amen? All right, let's stand up on our feet. Come on, let's lift our hands to heaven for a moment. Jesus, we ask to be witnesses for the kingdom of heaven. We ask, God, that you establish within our hearts the reverence that's needed to walk holy before our King. We ask, God, that holiness and righteousness and purity clothe us with humility. God, we ask that you keep us from strongholds, demonic power. We ask, God, that you help us to be the people you called us to be. Lord, we pray even this week that even from now till Sunday, you bring people before us that we might be a, a witness to. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, somebody say amen. God bless you all. I love you. We'll be back tomorrow night for prayer if you like. Amen. God bless.